<laughs> a book and a bear. <laughs> Hello. We're here. <laughs> and we're really unsure about how to feel about being here. Because this is the cursed episode of A Book and a Bev. Oh, it is. We are covering What Lies Beyond the Veil by Harper L. Wood. And no one is excited to be here because we have, in fact, already recorded half of this episode. We've already done this. <laughs> none, of, none of us are excited for this because not only that, but none of us were really head over heels about the book either way. So... Let's just get on in, shall we? I will. I would do the whole spiel, but you know, I don't really give You've a shit it. at this point. I don't give no. a shit. Read the blurb. <laughs> Read the blurb. That's it. That's it. Um, but the blurb is fucking massive as well. Look at that. Mm. All right, it's look. like a size six font. Unnecessary. It's a spicy Akatar read, but there's no incest, which is great. Um, but and it's not Akatar. It's not. It's not. That's what it was supposed to be like. But it, it was, was oversold. Not this. Oh, anyway, so what are we drinking? Look, I'm channeling the veil and I'm drinking my black gin with Sprite. So it's like a, look, I haven't mixed that yet, but it's like a purpley, pale purple colour. Beautiful. Nice. In a twist that will surprise no one, I'm drinking wine. Um, although surprisingly on theme this week because that's just about all anyone drinks in this book. So there you go. Mm. I'm also... Drinking wine. I would say it's clear, but it actually looks more like piss. So mm. everyone needs to piss. The person in this book probably pisses. So here we are. <laughs> oh, God. I am surprised we didn't get some weird moment where she's, like, crouching in the forest, pissing herself, and he makes some weird sexual remark. Yeah. Mm. That would have been very on trend on theme. Mm. Mm. Would have. Well, how did we all feel about the book? What was the vibe? This book was sold to me as the next Akatar, but make it spicy. Like Akatar is chicken wings, and this was going to be buffalo sauce chicken wings, right? Like hot wings, like yes. hot ones. The talk show. Oh yes, great yes. show, great show. But, but honestly, instead, all I got was KFC. So like, it's all right, but it gave me the shits. <laughs> <laughs> KFC regret. Yeah, literally. Absolutely. That shit literally goes, that shit literally actually, it goes right on through. It but does. This book did not hit it for me. Like it wasn't awful, but there was definitely some bits that made me not be able to commit to the love interest. Um, and I understand that our main character is young and she's somewhat naive, but I really felt like there was a bit of a disconnect between her internal monologue and her actions versus her trauma and where she's come from. Um the book itself is physically stunning. Like there's gorgeous artwork on each chapter and there's these beautiful black pages. But, yeah, it, it didn't hit it for me, unfortunately. No, agreed, agreed. I loved the first quarter of the book, like the world building, the plot with the female mm. main character reclaiming her power from controlling wank strain men. But when we met our love interest, I was just not about it at all. I wanted a slow burn romance built on the foundation of banter and shared trauma. And what I got was a man fairy with a penis the size of my forearm, constantly battering the pussy and nothing about it was okay. <laughs> I do not like this man. Pussy. The pussy. Okay. <laughs> Big sigh. Our attitude this episode is going to be, if you had gotten the first recording, we were on fire. We were we were on a whole other level. I'm in my oody because I give that little shit right now. She gives zero of the shits. Zero of the shits. She Except only when has I eat KFC. the shits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, yeah, this book was not what I expected. Like, I'd heard really amazing things on, like, TikTok and, like, Facebook groups of it being a spicy actor, as Brian said, and I was so excited. I recommended this book. I put this in. So if you have anyone to blame, you can blame me. But in reality, I'm already blaming myself enough, okay? But, but you hadn't deliver. read the book before you recommended it, had yeah. you? Yeah, I had not. I hadn't yeah. even read the blurb because it was too many words. So we can forgive you for that. If you had read it mm. and put it in, I would have serious <laughs> questions. Yeah. Mind you, you did recommend Credence. Oh, I did recommend true. Credence. 
But the second time through, I did not like it, so it's all right. <laughs> We're all allowed um, to evolve. But, yes. We've no, got reader's no. regret. We do, yeah. Well, look, I liked the smut. I just didn't like the smut with the characters, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like, I think the characters... I just didn't really like them and I didn't really think the smut belonged in this type of book. Just didn't think it was there. And I also just guessed absolutely everything. The entire plot, I guessed it. I was like, I know what is happening. So this book was not only not great, but it was very predictable, which I Mm -hmm. hate in a book. So we basically start off before the book actually starts. We get like a hierarchy of gods. We get glossary of terms which aren't really relevant anyway half yeah like there's bits where it's like so we get the name for the fey realm which you don't go into in this book you get told what a witch is it's like that i knew my friend (laughs) yeah (laughs) we start chapter one and we meet the main character barlow or is it estrella we don't know because at one stage she's being called Barlow and then her name is Estrella, like she's the ugly stepsister from Cinderella and I don't know what the fuck is happening. Yeah. I realise at this stage as well that I also don't do sports and I know like Ellie has tried to explain sports to me before and that you call sporty people by their surname and that's the thing. So is her name Estrella, first name, surname, Barlow? That would make sense. I think so. We'll just Uh, take that and run with it. Not that she's playing sport uh, of any kind. She's picking berries. No. You know. Yeah. Look, she's doing a lot of physical activity, really. Her little pussy is going through it. (laughs) (laughs) That went downhill. Not right now. It's not. So quickly. Well, when you think about it, she is as well, though. (laughs) No. Jesus. Oh my I've got god, this is going to be a train no. wreck. This is going to be a fun... No. Okay, we're going to just... Nope, step around that trauma. We're ignoring it. So um, Estrella is picking berries, as we said. That is the only physical activity she is doing. And she's being watched by the royal guard. So we find out that the bush that she is picking, plucking the berries from is very prickly. And a prickly Lorne... bush. Sorry, I just... Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> prickly bush. We also find out that the Lord, like the head of the King's Guard, is Lord Byron. A.K.A. Brett Kavanaugh. Yes. That's exactly right. Anyway, he's a bit of a sleaze, A.K.A. Brett. Basically, Lerner is closest to the Vale. It basically separates them, the humans, the peasants, from the Fae of Aphelimla. I really tried there. Sorry. Not at all. Alphamere? Alphamere. Alphamere. So her family, we find out that her family is very, very poor. She is the peasant of the peasants and her mother is disabled giving birth to her, uh, but she's still made to do some labour. But because our main girl is letting Lord Brett put berries in her mouth, oh. as one would say. Um, <laughs> oh, no, I just pictured berries. As one would say. <laughs> I mean, there's literal berries. Mm, he's dangling the screw. <laughs> Her mum is not made to do the prickly bush stuff. She's just made to do some other bits of labour because, again, she's a peasant still. So we find out that in this realm the gods demand purity until marriage. So Brett is not allowed to touch Estrella in well, that he's not, way. He's not allowed to do vaginal penetration with the child that he is grooming. Yes. But he can do other stuff. But I do need to just quickly jump on and on in here and reference a specific quote that made my skin crawl, which is, but that kindness came at a price and I swallowed when I thought of paying it later that night when Lord Byron's soft manicured hands would feed me twilight berries and other delicacies as the hard length of him pressed against me. And it's just the soft manicured hands here. I just, I can't stomach it. I'm all for hygiene, but. Oh God. And there's also a moment where he licks the blood of her fingers and like yeah. saves it. And it's like, this is weird. This is odd. And she's like, I, d- I don't like this either. Get your manicured your fingers away from me Eek. we meet estrella's brother bran aka brandon stuck aka um, sultana bran sultana bran because he's at bland as well he is. so 
Estrella is basically being groomed to protect her family, but then her brother's just out here stealing food, risking everything. And so it's like, does he know or does he not know? Because there's a lot of bits where I'm like, I think he knows. Oh, and yet he'd still oh, risk her. 100% yeah. he knows. And let's say it all together. Yeah, sometimes. White male privilege. Um, there, there it is. There it is. Plus, White- well, we then learn her father is dead. His throat was sliced open. We learn that the last words her father said to her were, fly free, little bird. And I just picture that meme of Kim Kardashian hiding behind a bush and like slowly emerging as Nelly Furtado as she pops up <laughs> and starts singing somewhere. <laughs> oh, oh my God. Yeah, FYI, um, our girl's dad was sacrificed to the veil to renew its strength to protect all the humans. So that seems pretty chill and not ominous at all. At all. From here, our main G goes for midnight walks in the forest. She's a, she's a little rebellious in this way. You know, her life is fucking shit, but she can at least go for a mental health walk. Hot girl, mental health walk. In the middle of the night. <laughs> It's while she's on one of her hot girl mental health books that she sees people dressed in all white and they are praying to the old gods, which is giving us some very strange vibes. It's also giving her weird vibes, but nonetheless, she feels drawn to them. So she goes and she hides and she's like, they will never see me. But really, she's like when you see a child or like a dog and they're standing behind something and they're like, no, you can't even see me, but you definitely can. So Mm. they actually go up and they're like, let's engage in casual conversation in this moment. Because they're probably Um, sitting there like, we're just having a peaceful little picnic out here in the moonlight and who's this fuckwit standing behind a tree thinking that we can't see her when we're clearly looking right at her. Now it's awkward because we've seen her, so we've yeah. got to invite her over. And they've got, yeah. like, cake and stuff, and they're like, well, what if we didn't have an extra slice of cake? Yeah, yeah seriously. She ends up joining in their ritual and learns more about the old gods, and they do this weird ritual where they place candles on stones, and if their candle falls off, it's a sign that they're going to die during the winter. Cool. Estrella is still a sceptic because in the patriarchy and their religious purity culture that she has been raised in, thinking about the old gods or anything else is like sacrilegious. But the quote she gets is, one should always remember that history is written by the victor, a.k.a. the U.S. Constitution was written by slave owners. Mm-hmm. It was I mean, indeed. I was shocked at this point. Yeah. Fuck the patriarchy. <laughs> anyway. <sighs> So yeah. we find out that apparently Estrella has been fucked, not by Lord Manicured Hands, but by someone else. And it's like, that's right. don't worry, babes, because she's all like, you know, she's like, well, that's it for me. I had to, I had to do it. So she's already like, well, I'm not pure. Okay. So the only thing in her internal dialogue that she's told us, the only thing that has stopped Lord Brett Kavanaugh from fucking her is the fact that she can't be fucked if she's a virgin. It's purity culture. Mm -hmm. So then she proceeds to go and fuck someone, granted to be able to make the decision for herself, but also then putting herself at more risk. She, I don't, I just, I'm like. Yeah, make it make sense. No, it doesn't. Her, and her internal dialogue is not like, I had to make this one decision for myself and fuck the world and damn the risk and I'm like, it's not that. And then let alone, like, the spicy little detail that if she was found that she wasn't a virgin, she would probably be killed. Or be forced to become a lady of the night. Oh, my God. But in all honesty, guys, we all would have been ladies of the night if we were in this era. Oh, fuck yeah. yeah. We also then do another ritual because we're still at this little KKK meeting, which is awesome. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> well, it is. It is a bunch of white pe- white people in cloaks. White. There white is ass. a distinct lack of people of colour in this there book. There is. It's like who in the book is a person of colour, who in the book is gay or bi or any of the other LGBTQ spectrum. Because well, even when we get to. Yeah. No. Well, I mean, there might have been a thruple, which yeah. I'm intrigued about. Oh, yeah. There, yeah, there was like a man with like slaves. Um, The re- rebel captain chick. Yeah, oh, Miriam right. or whatever her name was. I was Miriam. actually talking about the god of death. Who, they were, in that picture, oh. he had like two women down at his knees, you know, and I was like, oh, him and his slave women. It is. Because it's because of his giant horse schlong. They were just hypnotised. He was waving around his ankles. <laughs> <laughs> <vehicles. laughs> <laughs> really hypnotising women. <laughs> I'm fairly sure if I saw someone 
just thrusting their hips in a circle and I was watching their giant <laughs> flaccid penis do a helicopter. <laughs> The first thing I would be doing is not getting on my knees in preparation. <laughs> Hello, ladies. I know you are mesmerized because I am a blonde love interest. Uh-huh. But wait, there's more. <laughs> my Look giant at my horse dick. Strong. <laughs> I can win, Millen. Watch it move. <laughs> anyway, the ritual. Yeah, that's right. We're still there. Um, oh. <laughs> She basically, they start eating cake because this is a part of the ritual, apparently. And then there's like this weird noise. And then she turns around and her candle that was on her rock has fallen off. So as we said earlier, that means that she's not going to make it through the winter and she will indeed be fucked. Oh, mm. God. Okay. <laughs> so look, imagine we, we if learned... that's what it was predicting. I <laughs> predict you will be fucked. From here, we learn that our girl Estrella hates marriage and doesn't want to get married. Smash the patriarchy, fuck it up. But basically the culture she's in, she will be forced to be married and then become someone else's property. She basically, we find out that, yes, she has to sell herself to get the good graces from the Lord. Uh, Lord Manicure Fingers, hands, little hands. Brett Kavanaugh. That's it. Brett, we hate him. Anyway, the quote is, I grasped his hand in mine gently, leaning forward to touch my lips to his ring as I counted. One, I want to gut you while you sleep. Two, you are the worst of humanity. Three, fuck it up, sis. And while she's kissing the ring, his wife is just off to the side, giving her like stinky eyes. Estrella goes to temple and the priestess makes them all chant. We are women. Our duty is to our homes and our husbands, to our sons and daughters so that the next generation may be even stronger. Now we bow our heads and pray for forgiveness for our wicked thoughts, for our sinful desires, which tempt us away from the absolution only the mother can provide. I would be absolutely fucked. They would be like, bitch, you are literally the devil itself. Mm. So we learn that the girls are tested for their purity and that when she was last tested, the doctor lied on her test and said that she was still a virgin, even though she isn't. So mentally, she is freaking out. And we find out as well, again, that they sacrifice someone to the veil to help renew the magic. And, you know, it's just a lot of foreshadowing and a lot of weird shit, and it's stressful. Fuck it up. You know, I think she just literally breathes, um, yeah. and she breathes a bit too loudly. So the priestess decides that this is a teachable moment, mm-hmm. and starts beating the shit out of her with a cane. But then Brett Kavanaugh steps in and he's like, no, 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 I've got this. Sends everyone from the room, proceeds to beat her still, and then goes, this is because I know that you fucked someone. I know you're not a virgin, so you're going to come to the library tonight for punishment. But she doesn't really have a choice, so she's on her way to meet with Lord Soft Hands when she notices a bird watching her. Which, get fucked. Oh. Also, does this ever come back around? Does not. No. Do we ever discover that, like, he is the bird? has bird oh, magic? He is could the you bird. imagine? It doesn't come back, though. Like, it there's it no other mention of if this bird has any relevance. No. So as our weird chick is walking to be punished in the library, she runs into Slow Loris, a.k.a. Isaac Hale, a.k.a. the man that she fucked. He apparently has taught her some basic self-defence and, you know, the quote is, it wasn't love but it was as close as the two of us would ever come, a rebellion against the life chosen for us where his duty demanded he would never marry and mine condemned me to it. Well, that sounds awful. Anyway, we find out that she has dark hair and green eyes, which I very much enjoy. Her and Slow Lawrence have to go their separate ways because obviously his duty comes first and now the Lord knows knows it's much too dangerous for him and like a part of me was like come on so loris fight for her but no so <sighs> at this stage while she's on a little stroll she's also walking close to the veil and we get this quote where sometimes in the night i looked into that mist and swore i saw the shining beacon of dazzling blue eyes staring back at me first That's off i have a couple points here first off i thought he had dark eyes but now he's got blue eyes here unsure then if she has been seeing old mate through the veil her whole fucking life, has he just literally been standing there on the other side just like, what's up? Just watching her. Anyways, um, Brett Kavanaugh finds her in the forest and makes slow Loris drag her to the library because that's not traumatic. Estrella is hurt in this moment that slow Loris does not look after her and does his duty, which, again, why are we surprised? 
The Lord wants to make her a wifey. He is actually, in fact, killing his wife with poison. Our girl is literally like, no. And then he just bitch slaps her. But then he's like, but take the night to think about it, my love. My favorite quote here. I would sooner die than allow you to shove that flaccid flesh between your legs inside me. And well, from this point, you can see why I had such high expectations because things were looking good. Yes. Far. Like she's fucking the patriarchy. Yeah. She's yeah. like, take you and your sick wife and shove it up your tiny little asshole, soft hands. I'm going to do my own <laughs> thing. <laughs> Sultana Brand from here sees her face with the scratch on it from the bitch slap and she proceeds to tell her brother what's happening and how she doesn't want it to happen. And that's basically it because he does absolutely nothing to support her or offer her any sort of solution. No. Why would he? He's a man. Look, and turns out Lord Manicure's soft hands was successful at yeeting his wife from the group chat. And so we're at her funeral. Soft hands basically gets in her face and is like, let's take a stroll. And he tells her that he wanted her as a wife and took interest in her when her father died. Because he mm. saw how much she loved her father mm. and cried when he died. And he was like, this bitch could teach my children how to love me. No, let's all bear in mind, she was also eight at the time of his death. So he's looking at this eight-year-old being like, oh, your sad daddy's dead? Mm, I'll be your daddy now. No. Like, fuck, oh, oh, soft no. hands. Oh, oh. Really? oh dear God. <laughs> say anyway she obviously says no i do not want to do this the alternative to this arrangement is that she then has to be the sacrificial lamb to the veil everyone's very upset everyone is crying as the knife is pressed to her throat but there is something on the other side of the veil because imagine this picture the scene right she's on her knees she's kneeling in front of the veil and the Knife is being pressed to her throat. On the other side of the veil, Blue Eyes is kneeling, just staring at her, <laughs> hoping that he can convey with his mind, with his giant penis hypnotising. <laughs> <laughs> like a clock. <laughs> that, that's what's hitting the veil. It's just, it's just <laughs> his penis. <laughs> and she's like, I must touch it, you know? No. <laughs> she goes to touch it. And then it shatters. Everyone is down, down and out after the veil shatters. She wakes up a little bit before everyone else and she's in in a little bit of pain. She feels like her whole entire body's on fire, which doesn't sound fun. It's the penis. She, it's, the, <laughs> it's the penis. It was the touch the of the penis. <laughs> yeah. God. Turns out he had a sexually transmitted disease, so it does feel like fun. <laughs> the burning sensation you're feeling is not normal. In fact, I really recommend you go see your gynecologist. <laughs> as soon as possible again at this stage i've still got high hopes for the book and when there's the banging penis on the other side of the veil you hear a roar and i was like god i could get behind this because you you know you're like someone doesn't want her to die very few other people don't want her to die that energy then disappears it does anywho she's burning not from an std but just from life and she goes to find her mum and sultana bran and her mum's like cereal Please take her into the forest oh, no, because she has real. been marked. She needs to be <laughs> saved by you and your bland, bland hands. Off you go. <laughs> we learn that, yes, she is in fact marked. And, yes, she now has a fey mate. And I am so excited for her. But she, on the other hand, is not excited. We also learn like a snowball of information basically one of those things is that phase cannot take human consorts it is against bro code which also okay so they cannot take human consorts but then they're fey mate hmm. does any of this make sense no don't question it if you don't question it and you just keep reading it's fine slow loris finds her and it, we're like yay slow loris but then no slow loris his superior is there and he's like i hate to break it to you but you are going to have to kill this girl. And mm-hmm. Slow Loris is like, no, I can't. And we're like, yay, good for you doing the bare minimum. But then his superior is like, nah, she's not the girl you knew anymore. Now she's nothing more than some fey bastard's whore. That's, That's fucking cool. rough. Hmm. Look, we don't deal with slut shaming here. Mm-hmm. So fuck right off. And also she has only fucked Slow Loris. So she's obviously <laughs> not a whore. She's not. Slow Loris ends up then trying to kill her. 
because duty comes first. That's such a fucking cop out. She then all of a sudden gets the tinglies and it's not the STD. And these, what I want to bring back one of my favorite things I've ever said on this podcast it's the fire noodles. Yes. So then these like fiery noodles come out and they start to like suck the life out of him and he starts to age. But really, as much as I love fire noodles, she says that it's cold and it's like wintry. She's got like some snow magic that's tied into her that we find out later. So is she in fact a snow cone maker? Potentially. <laughs> yes. She's a McDonald's slushy machine. <laughs> um, She'll malfunction all the time. Then. <laughs> she's yeah, got she's... block ducks. <laughs> she does. So then not only has she sucked the life out of him, but then his like neck just snaps and it's like Vecna. Where you were at. Literally. Not only does she kill the slow Laura, she also kills the superior, which we're not upset about. She's freaking out. She's like, oh, my God, that was so crazy. And then Sultana's brain is like, oh, my God, we've got to go because you're just killing people. This is a drastic turn of events. So then they just keep traveling and they're running. And then apparently the wild hunt is coming because that's a thing that we never return to. No. We get this moment that, again, at this stage, I'm still like, oh, potential, I love this book. And she feels the moment that her bay marked partner steps into the human realm. Like, she feels it. She gets the fanny flutters, the titty tingles. And I was like, yes, I can get behind this. That feeling did not last. The Wild Hunt are after them. They play a little game of hide and seek. And she falls asleep and is then woken up by Sultana Bran being like, shh. And it's like, well, if you'd just let me continue sleeping, I would have remained quiet. But as, okay, sir, I'm awake now. I fucking hate that. I hate it when people are like, shh, be quiet. It's like, I was the fucking sleep, you cunt. (laughs) I can't get any more quiet. Literally. Um, unless you're a snorer, then that might be a little bit different. Mm. Maybe she's yeah, got look. maybe she's got blocked ducks not only down Can we stop also- saying <laughs> blocked ducks? As someone who has dealt my, with my that. boobs hurt. <laughs> and do you know how hearing. you're meant to so, get blocked yes. ducks clear? Yes. Mm. Yes. I don't I just don't wanna I don't want my, my brain going there in this book. The oh. main Caleb already does enough weird shit. I don't need to be picturing him sucking <laughs> out someone's blocked ducks. He fucking would too. He'd be like, I do like dairy products. Oh, I am does. not lactose intolerant. I am not throwing uh-uh. bowels after too much lactose. Uh, no. Look, at this stage, I'm like, oh, my God, there's a hot, long-haired, white walk dude on the back of his bone horse. And I was like, scary saddle club, but maybe this is the love interest. Oh. We're unsure. Scary, scary saddle, club. saddle club. Then senses her. And luckily or unluckily, the hounds that are with the scary saddle club sent someone else first and so they're off and they're chasing the peasants. And she is her and Sol Tana Brand live to see another day. Oh good. The peasants. Fuck the peasants. That's that's basically what these wild hunts people were saying. They were like, fuck 'em. Anyway, so basically it's nighttime again. Uh what is time? It is but a construct. So she is trying to escape without her brother knowing. Um, she doesn't want to risk his life, but of course, oh, fuck him. because she is a silly bugger, he hears her and they end up hugging and have some brotherly sister, sister bonding, but it's actually nice in this book to not have any incest. It's There's just no purely fucking... platonic brother, sister, love. It's nothing else. I would say that it is like what you would expect a brother-sister relationship to be, except then he goes and he tells her that she should kill herself. That's exactly right. Yeah, Yeah, he does. It's a bit like, well, just calm down, sir, actually. Just take it. You're here. You need to be down here. (laughs) You're here, down here. Not here. Move it down. (laughs) Move it down. You You want to be here, but you're here. (laughs) Again. (laughs) We were having a nice moment. Drop it down. For the majority of our listeners that are listening via audio, there are a lot of (laughs) hand gestures happening right now. (laughs) Anyway, (laughs) he then comes out with this quote, which just pissed me off, which is, sometimes ignorance is bliss, little sister. Enjoy it while it lasts. And I was literally like, suck my fucking dick. 
you bland motherfucker. So does he, What? how much does he know and about what? That's exactly right. There's a lot of foreshadowing. Uh-huh. That and yet, like, obviously, it's, yeah, obviously it's first book. You don't get all your answers. But seriously, it's a bit, there's a bit too much. There's a bit too much mm. that we don't get. Anyway, but then they're wandering and then one of the misguard is there and her brother is like, run, Estrella. So they're running and the misguard <laughs> catches them. But he kind of looks dead. It's weird. We're not sure. We're moving on. But he does try to kill them. In the end, they kill him. What we learn here, very importantly, is that iron dampens her magic, a.k.a. her fire needles. A.k.a. it turns off the snow cone maker. It does. It does. The it Mac is fault. The, we should the probably let Mac is know. Mm. We should just send them like yeah, a little... Look- Hi, have you got any type of iron in your machines? Because that could be your issue. The block ducks thing does track with the whole Mac is malfunctioning because it is teenagers cleaning out those machines. So you just have to know that there's some form of like clogged up dairy product. Just send old Caleb in there. He'd be yeah, he'd be able to un- unclog yeah. those ducks. Unclog He'll it with like, one suck. I've got this, guys. <laughs> Everyone's like, what is he doing? There's just this giant female <laughs> with this giant dick. It's like a Jim's mowing franchise. But it's like. Faye Windermill Dick Services. <laughs> no. He's like a tradie with multiple. He's, he could do many things with that. It could be an antenna. I can mm-hmm. cut the grass. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we're at a barn now, though. <laughs> and so Tana Brand is like, I must go get us some food. And thank God he leaves because then hiding in the back, there is a man and not just any man. He is the duct clogger and unclogger. He's versatile. Undo Maru Uno. He causes a problem, but he can also fix it. And he can also mow your lawn. (laughs) That he can. No more prickly bushes when he's around. Uh -uh. Nope. Anyway, so we get this quote. He gazed at me with dark eyes, peering out from a breathtakingly handsome face surrounded by short ash blonde hair. His bottom lip was thick and lush as he curled his mouth into an appeasing smile and his frame was tall, shoulders broad enough that I knew I didn't want him getting anywhere near me. And that's where you're wrong, my friend. We do indeed want him everywhere near you, in you and around you. But now I regret that statement. I don't know why I would have written that. I think it's because I write these notes as I go and yeah, we we've redacted got to go- that. Remember, we've got to go on the journey. It's fine. Yeah. So first off, the word lush as a descriptive mm. word for a lip threw me for a bit. So it was good. unusual. Secondly, in this moment, as he's trying to calm down this girl who is on the run, as he approaches her as a giant stranger, he calls her little one. So because he is so tall, and she is so little, little one. And I immediately think, oh, look, another brother figure. Because again, he calls her little one. Imagine if you called your partner little one. For anyone with a male partner, that would be a problem. It would be. <laughs> she is obviously like, fuck off, I've got to run. Tries to run, doesn't make it very far before he clamps his head over her mouth to shut her up. We get this quote. I bit down with all my strength in my jaw, not relenting when the coppery sweet taste of blood filled my mouth. When any normal person would have shouted or at least tried to get me to release his appendage from the vice-like grip of my teeth, he only chuckled in my ear and dragged me back to the pile of straw where I thought to relax. Careful, love. I just might like that. See, this is what I mean. I like if it wasn't him and her. It's also, it's just a copy paste of Poppy and Castile. It, yeah, yeah. And we get another one. It's literally the next quote we get is, you're a vicious one, aren't you? He asked, running his tongue over the top of his perfect bottom teeth. All right. Oh, I forgot about Ladies this and gentlemen, I would like you all, wherever you are listening to this or watching this, take a moment to imagine that you are sexy, you are a sexy man, and you're going to say you're a vicious one, aren't you? And then you're going to run your tongue over your bottom row of teeth. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, everyone. Exactly. This guy is also Faye marked, and we're all like, that's interesting. Cool, 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 cool. At this stage, I was like, maybe it'll be like a love triangle, right? Like there'll be 
him and she'll actually fall in love with him but she's Faye marked with someone else so then it will be like destiny and like versus chosen love like that type of thing mm-hmm. but no that was not meant to be Mm-mm. they chat and we find out that even though he's still calling her little one he actually has a name and it is Calum. we then get some pinky finger touching happening and then next minute sultana brand arrives and because he's very bland he is like get away with your eccentric attitude and your stupid nicknames get them away from my city we get another we get a pissing contest here basically two wild males fight for dominance but it's very bland and one is <laughs> it's just using his penis Are you as st- a fucking weapon <laughs> <laughs> he's like you think that's a spoon this is a spoon one arm's a shield one arm's a knife i've got you <laughs> have you ever played knife a spoonie before <laughs> proceeds to turkey's laughing <laughs> <laughs> anyway the brother does not take the hint that his sissy wants to get her knickers wet and is like we need to go and she's like, but the strong man said stay. And he called me little one. So girl who has been groomed immediately goes, tall male love interest tells me to stay. I should stay. I'm a good Even. girl. Immediately trusting. Interesting. So they then find out that her being the snow cone maker, aka what she did to slow Loris, who we've already forgotten about, is called Viniculum, which is the fey mark protecting her until she's bonded by coitus with her super magical fey mate. Ooh, cool. Very cool. But she ends up leaving with Brother Bran. As it turns out, Brother Bran is still hiding shit from her, which is surprising. Now he's a monk. <laughs> he, <is. laughs> he basically has the same personality. He's been just fucking weird and I'm just not here for it. I just, I need some more communication within this plot line, please. And bring yeah. her back to the sexy blonde man so at least they can like just do more than touch their pinkies. Yeah. But that was before I found out what he intends to do to her. And now I just wish she left. And her machine. Everything stayed yeah. normal. There's, here we are. Right now we've gone from the bit of the book where I was really like vibing with it. And she's now kind of being, she's just a passenger. She's mm. no longer trying to change her fate or deal with it or make decisions for herself. She's just being passed around like a football. Yeah, she's yeah. just the football. Look, at this stage, there's also a scary saddle club and they're being chased by the White Walkers again. But then Sultana Brand comes out with, she can't have you. Who is she? See, I would love to female yeah. love interest in here. Just throw will we, on. Yeah. Will we get closer to this in book one? We shan't. Absolutely we not. Shan't. Anyway, so to escape because there is no other way. They cannot outrun them. They must yeet themselves off a cliff. Apparently, Sultana Brand knew for a fact, because, again, he's hiding things, that she would not die. So she randomly just, like, stops before hitting the ground. And because she's such a good sister and she doesn't want Sultana Brand to die, she, like, holds onto his hand and dislocates her shoulder. So <sighs> she's just, all these things are happening. Not only did she think that she was just about to die, but then she just literally dislocated her shoulder instead. Yes, she stopped mid-fall. The White Walkers have actually come over the edge and she's not that far down. And they're like, actually, we can just yeet you back up. So they just get a little scoop, like a little ladle. She is the soup and they've just <laughs> scooped her up. Bran, in that moment, is like, we cannot let her have you. Remember? She, her. So he's like, I'll stab you, girl. Don't worry. Don't worry, sissy. I've got your back. And goes to try to stab her. Obviously, the White Walkers are a lot stronger than him and don't want that to happen. So they just kill him. They just literally grab him and just throw him right off the cliff again. Brother Bran is deceased. Yeeted. Just when we think all hope is lost, Caleb is here to save the day. He runs out of the tree line swinging his giant dick. <laughs> He's going to throw up oh. like a lasso over the edge he to, is. Try to save, he is. try to save Sultana Bren. In reality, he's actually gone. I'm going to come and help you and fight these White Walker Saddle Club men. Come with me. Let me save you. And she's like, actually, I would rather jump off the cliff and be with Brother Bran. So she does. And um, she does her little swan dive. Literally, as she is yeeting herself off the cliff, he is like, it's slow motion. He's like, Estrella, as she's going. And you're like, wow, I mean, yeah, sure, watching someone commit suicide is very horrific, but also 
That's a touch of an overreaction for someone you've just met once. Yeah, what a hint. What a fucking hint as to what is to come. Not that we Mm. already didn't fucking guess it or at least have an inkling as to what he was. Caleb obviously finds her um, because when she's muted herself off the clip, she's uh, actually become a spider monkey and has, like, gripped hold of the the cliff and has slid down it like a little little rat or something. Caelan finds her at the bottom and she is desperately trying to search for sultan, her sultan of her cereal. Her cereal. That is now soggy. soggy. Yeah, <laughs> soggy in the water. He finds her and he's like, dude, your bro is dead. And she's very upset about this. But then she actually is like, well, I'm actually feeling a lot better and now because you are caressing me because he is caressing her body in his trying to keep her warm as she cries for her lost Sultana brand cereal. And I, on the other hand, do not cry for the Sultana brand because it is the shittest of the cereals. So she wakes up to the smell of fish and I personally could fucking never. I would literally be vomiting my guts up. I would die. And look... And just to top off this shit morning wake up, he decides to start feeding her the fish. No. With his his callus. I mean, at least the callus is not manicured. It would be so much worse if they were softer manicured. It would be so much worse. So much worse. What in the actual fresh hell is this feeding shit? It's not that she is so gravely injured that she cannot lift her arms to feed herself. No, he's just like, no, 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 baby. Here comes the chopper. (laughs) <laughs> oh. oh the chopper oh god no. it's not sexy it is not caregiving mm-hmm. it is not protective vibes it is child no. vibes we hate it mm-hmm. this mm-hmm. is where i proceeded to get off the train yeah yeah he then basically takes her down to where she can wash her handy pandies <laughs> and in the meantime he helps her down some rocks and he like picks her up off the rocks and like <laughs> Puts her down. It's <laughs> my <laughs> brain. Her dad said to says, helps her down some rocks, like as in eat some rocks. And I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> it's just like, here's some fiber. <laughs> because remember her. earlier on, she, we think she might eat a rock. <laughs> she is related. She's actually a cannibal. Eat your brother. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, fucking hell. He helps her down the rocks by rubbing her down his long body so that she can feel the hard length of his giant schlong. He is also super long. Like, he's he is. very tall. It would have been so awkward. How long do you think he would have taken to get it? Five like, minutes later. <laughs> Anyways, normally I would, like, I, I've loved this type of thing where, like, Reese has done this before where, you know, they're so, like, I just need you to be touching me. I need to be touching you. I'll get whatever I can get. I love that. But he just fed her fish. He then gets all weirdly heavy and possessive and basically makes her promise him that they'll stay together forever. And it's like, Caelan, you met her 14 hours ago. She's grieving <laughs> and tired and you just force fed her fish. <laughs> now... It's not the time for these declarations, sir. Keep you and your fish fingers to yourself and your giant schlong. Put it back in the pants. No. But essentially, they climb back up the cliff, which sounds fun. And they set off on their little adventure together. Yeah, Ever. and they just end up like going for a nice little stroll. And our girl just is not happy to be alive because remember, her <laughs> brother, Sultana Brand, her cereal, told He's her soggy. that she must die. And she's somehow being like, maybe I should have died. Yeah. Yeah, maybe Without I should have done that. Any context. Yeah. And Callum is just like, whoa, 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 whoa. Your brother told you to fucking what? And she's like, oh, no, he didn't. He didn't do that. Oh, no. And then we get this quote. This is one thing I will not tolerate from you. If you want to keep your secrets, then fine. Keep them. But at least give me the respect of not looking me in the eye and tainting that pretty mouth with ugly lies. And I just thought that was quite hot. If you remove the first sentence. Yeah, don't know. So take out the, that is one thing I will not tolerate from you because I am your father and you are my child. Mm. If you just have, if you want to keep your secrets, that's fine. Keep them. But at least give me this respect of not looking me in the eye and tainting that pretty mouth with ugly lies. That's hot. Yeah. I'm down for that. Yeet that first first sentence. It's just a bit too super nanny for me. Yeah. Oh, super nice. Why would you bring her into this? 
That behaviour is unacceptable. Please go take a seat on the naughty step. So it's all happening now very quickly. He's in her head. The giant schlong has embedded itself into the brain waves. He manifested it with the windmill swirls, and now she's just thinking about it constantly. Mm -hmm. She's also in his head because he's having wet dreams about her, having a blade to his throat, which, like, I'm all here for a knife king, but please don't have your wet dreams, especially when we're sharing a swag. (laughs) Yeah. Seems unhygienic. He starts doing things where she has this internal monologue and then he immediately says something that addresses that. Mm. So can he read minds? Will we get clarification on this issue in this book? No, sir, we will not. Anyways, from here, we go from Knife King and possible telepathy to pet names. Uh. And it's all a bit weird because, again, Little One is not my favourite pet name. In fact, I hate it. And then he also does this thing where he won't let her get dressed without him watching her. And it's like, you literally just met this bitch. You don't know each other. It's been 14 hours. Calm down. Give her some fucking space. He then calls her the most beautiful woman he's ever seen. And it's like, that's nice, but this is also still very, very fast. Yeah. Our girl is feisty. And the quote we get is, I need you alive for now, but that doesn't mean I need you to have all of your appendages functioning. I've kind of always wondered how a man would scream if I cut off his prized flesh between his thighs. You would need a motherfucking chainsaw to get through this giant cock. It'd be like cutting down a heritage tree. (laughs) Just Everyone's got their side of the axe. We're going back and forth. It's a joint (laughs) axe. (laughs) We get the one bed trope, but it's actually not one bed trope. It's one cloak trope because they share a cloak like a blankie and they snuggle beneath the stars. His lips like brush her forehead and that makes my insides warm. That's very lovely. I actually do like it when the... the I do like forehead. Yeah. 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 But also it's been 14 hours and you're kissing her on the forehead. Yeah, it's a bit weird. It's a bit weird, isn't it? Anyway, so they keep having like these almost moments whilst walking and I'm like, if you're going to like talk it up this much, like you may as well just fuck already. You know what I mean? It's just annoying me. Like you're trying to be a slow burn while making him like the literal dirtiest of foulest of mouths but she is like i cannot let you near this pussy and the quote is i wouldn't allow myself the heartbreak of losing someone else i cared about so i wouldn't go there with him no matter how tempting it might be because the one and only man i'd ever allowed to touch me had turned into a pile of snow when he tried to kill me it was safe to say my vagina was unfortunately off limits and, like, she's not wrong because, A, he did turn into a pile of snow, and then, B, he definitely did try to kill you. So that is two very big no-nos. They end up chatting about family because that's a great topic to start with when you, her brother just died. Yeah. But that's okay. So he then acts a little judgy with her situation with Slow Loris and Lord Soft Hands, and she gets rightfully pissed because, remember, we've only known you for 18 hours, sir. So. And the quote is, I have a name, I said, the words coming out more sternly than I intended. I'm aware. It's a beautiful name, he said, the corner of his mouth chipping up in amusement. It filled me with the urge to punch him in the throat, knowing that he didn't take my anger seriously. I feel like that's a pretty good quote because I also have the urge to punch him in the throat for the entire book. Yeah. And also that is exactly how you feel when you're angry and someone doesn't think you're angry. Yeah, they mm-hmm. belittle your anger. I fucking hate mm-hmm. that. I might be yeah. small, but I can fuck you up. So we get this <laughs> moment where she goes to do just that, punch him <laughs> in the throat, and he captures her wrist, and then their bodies are harassed together. And he's like, you want me? And she's like, no, I fucking don't. And he goes, whatever you tell yourself to help you sleep at night, little one, I sleep quite peacefully with my head filled with thoughts of you and your breathy voice moaning my name while I devour you. And just to top that off, for you, I can be downright fucking filthy, Estrella, and you will love every God's damn second of it. See, and if it was anyone else saying these things and we, we just That's a hot we just yeet out the little one, I would be... I would be all on this guy's dick, even if it would tear me in two. But because it's him yeah, and he uses little I'd be one, like, that's a good way to go. Yeah, fuck it up. That's how I think of Cassian's dick. Yeah, skewer me like a fucking kebab. Let's go. If Cassian said, for you, I could be downright fucking filthy. And you will love every goddamn second of it. 
I would be like... Like, I just mentally just checked out for a second. Yeah. Just at the sheer thought of it. Yeah, yeah no, it's not Cassie to no. me. It's it's Asriel. If Asriel said those Ooh. things... Asriel saying he can be... Oh, oh. fuck. Yeah, no. Mm. Yes. Holy fucking sweet baby Jesus. In fact, Jesus, are you still here, bro? So from this stage, he is trying to be both protective but is also wanting her to fight her own battles. And the quote we get is, the next time a man like the Lord of Mistfell tries to put his hands on you without your permission, you stab him in the fucking throat, he said, touching soft fingers to the bottom of my chin and tipping my face up to meet his stares. He has soft fingers. Oh, no. They're travelling through something called the hollows and Callum shows our girl a secret hiding spot and there's drawings of the old gods on the walls and we get some backstory about Caleb because we don't know too much at this stage but he says that his father thought that to kill their enemy they had to know their enemy aka the fae and we learn about a few different gods goddesses like Twyla the goddess of the moon and Mab who is the queen of the court of shadows and Caleb seems to think that if Mab didn't exist there could be peace between their races. Estrella gets like super spooked about this and also about there's a particular carving of the god of the dead on the wall. Hmm. Anyway. Quick side note here. Do we think that Mab is Kalen's evil stepmom? Yes. Mm. And that's Great. the she okay. that mm-hmm. her brother was referring to. Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Glad we're all on the same page then. Cool. We learn also in this moment that Faye's power is amplified when they complete their mating bond via super secret coitus. And if they don't and the human is killed before they can complete the bond, then the Faye could also die as well, which is super interesting. Plot. No. No. <laughs> no, no, the plot does not thicken. The plot has stayed thin, very thin. Estrella then starts having doubts about her potential relationship. And I'm like, what potential relationship? You've literally just met this weirdly possessive, somewhat desperate man. Your brother just died. She's contemplating that he wouldn't understand that she needs more from him than the promise of one night of pleasure. And it's like, but how you're getting a bit too ahead of yourself here, Estrella. It's been like, 16 hours. Doesn't yeah. matter how much of a magic pain he's got it's been 16 hours exactly but anywho they stumble upon a pool of water which is actually a giant orgy pool where gods and humans would come to celebrate the death of these two gods son by having okay. giant orgy so you're two gods mm. You've mm-hmm. had a son. Your son has mm-hmm. died. He's Eutus what Fetus. What better way? At this stage, you're like, what way can we commemorate his life? I know. Orgies. <laughs> Orgies. Yeah. Sex. Orgies. Orgies in the water where all of our bodily fluids can be exchanged oh, in a no. very messy way. Mm-mm. I'm sure that's just what little Billy wanted. Oh, his no, parents. his name was Billy. <laughs> Oh, no. This whole thing is just extremely disturbing because what grieving parents would most definitely do is celebrate the life of their child by fucking each other with a bunch of people on his birthday. Yeah, fuck Billy, whatever. They then decide literally, but not literally, (laughs) their parents will fuck. (laughs) They do not fuck the dead child. Look, I wouldn't. They did not fuck their dead child. Georgia (laughs) would like to clarify, (laughs) and I am putting that on Georgia. (laughs) Oh, it just came out. Fuck it up. Anyway, fucking hell. So they then decide to have a little swim in the orgy bodily fluids, and of (laughs) and of course, we find out in this moment that (laughs) no, (laughs) you know when you go in the in a pool and you've all had sunblock on. Oh, and the water gets oh no, <laughs> gets all murky. I refuse. Ew, ew, no, ew, ew, no. And then you come out a bit slimy. Oh. Oh. <laughs> but really, it's just mum and dad's juice. Oh. <laughs> oh no, it's a good thing Billy's dead because he would not want to be around for this shit. <laughs> I can't. I need a moment after that one. <laughs> Anyway, oh, man. so we find out that, of course, Caleb has a giant fucking horse cock that hangs down his thigh, that <laughs> wiggles around like a little a oh, well, giant fuck-off worm that hypnotises you and it's ready to go. Um, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it a worm? <laughs> We've gone from a windmill and then I can see your brain went W. <laughs> worm. <laughs> Now I'm just picturing it with a face, which is very unfortunate. 
Oh. Anyway, so she also agrees with the statement of us all being like, fucking hell, that's a giant cock. We get the quote. She goes, that looks more like a torch device than an instrument for pleasure. And she's not wrong because some of these men I literally think could stake me with their giant peni. It is very ridiculous. So we then get this quote from him, which is, when the time comes, you'll take all of it and beg me to fuck you harder. And I'm not going to repeat the last... (laughs) two words of that sentence because I don't want to because that just itself is beautiful. Little one. Oh, Why does it have to be ruined like that? You know what I mean? Isn't that a song? No, that's the little boy drama. Don't! Come bang on my drum. Oh! <laughs> All right, so he comes into the bath, doesn't come in the bath, he walks into it, and she's like... Can you just imagine he's just walking in? Can you scream? As he walks in, he's like, little bit over here, little bit over here, little bit over here, little bit for everyone! He's like Oprah, you get some gum, you get some and she, she looks at him entering the bath and is like, absolutely not. But then also the bath is warm and she's like, I am a peasant. That would be nice. So she gets in the bath and he tries to help her with like getting a knot out of her hair. And the quote is... Because he's right. not wearing any pants. <laughs> he's like, I'm not wearing any trousers. <laughs> and she says, and that is the problem. I like my intestines in my stomach and not shoved into my lungs. You just keep that thing away from me. Brilliant. Fucking hell. Brilliant. Brilliant. That is a yeah. sentiment we should have held on to. Mm. He helps her get the tangle out of her hair. He uses some demisting spray and the tangle comb and he gets it out for her. They discuss his family life when we learn that not all scars are visible like hers, which is deep. When she gets out of the pool, he notices her scars on her back where Lord Dickhead would whip her. And we get the quote, he will suffer for every mark on your skin, every moment he frightens you, every tear you shed before I finally put him out of his misery. And you'd think that, yes, we have a who did this to you trope. But unfortunately, the giant dick weird nickname and just bizarre foundation of this entire relationship has ruined it for me. I may also still be stuck on the whole orgy commemorating the Billy. Oh, you know, that's fucking bad. Billy. So he also has some scars on his back and she also asks, who did this to you? But it's minus the suffering of the who did it to him because she's just a curious cat. Just wants to know who actually did it to him. Not because she cares about him, just because she wants to know. And then they almost fuck, but they don't because they end up getting dressed because winter is coming. And they are not. Oh, <laughs> dear God. They certainly are not. Not yet anyway. How could yes. you when that Later. giant not thing yet. is fucking shoved up in you, clogging your ducks? Jesus. It would come back. If he came in, Saji, it would come back up. Oh, like, my God. through the nose. Mm. Jesus. So they go to another cave place and build a fire and huddle around and sing campfire songs. Or not a song, it's a story. So he runs his finger through her hair, specifically her part line. (laughs) Well, he tells her this story, which I don't really take any interest in because I just really want them to fuck by now. But it was about primordials, which are the creators of the old gods, essentially. Now, I'm not sure if anyone else glossed over this, but essentially there were the two first primordials who had a child. The mother of said child, and I quote, jilted her previous lover in favour of her son. Oh! Oh, no, there is the incest. Lamp. We had incest. So Estrella wakes up in the cave and she is sprawled over Caelan in her sleep. When she goes to get up, he flips her over and lays on top of her and is like, oh, my God, where are you going? That was a nice snug. She's not happy about this because his hands is on her butt and he's like, I want you to love me. And she's like, whoa, Nelly, we are just friends. Calm the farm. And the quote we get is, Do friends get jealous of past lovers? Because I cannot promise I wouldn't disembowel any man who has been inside you. Which, again, I would like it if it wasn't coming from him and if it hadn't been 16 hours. Literally. So they get up because she's hungry. hungry girl. They need to get her some cereal, some Sultana boy in. She's going to eat her brother. <laughs> oh, my God. So then they're travelling to some other mountains. So now they're finding a resistance because there's a resistance just now, guys. Dropping FYI. random shit in there. Out of the blue. Mm-hmm. He just drops that. That seems oh, likely. No worries. So he notices that she has blisters and decides get in bitch we're going shopping but instead of getting in a car 
he decides she's getting in the car of his back and he will carry her to get new boots. <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't know. Just keep going. The car of his back. <laughs> and then I like you're like, keep going. It's still you. <laughs> They start talking dirty, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> talking about biting off do. penis. And we get what? this quote. I think we both know that there wouldn't be many better ways to die than with your lips wrapped around my cock, blank, blank. The only thing that might be better if I was between your pretty thighs sinking inside you while you struggled to take me. Oh, lots of struggles. I'm struggling with this mm. book. Struggling to take the book that is this penis. <laughs> Sorry, it's like this um, giant book penis. <laughs> it's not about size. It's about how you fucking use it. And if she is struggling to take you, you're not using it no, well. You need to you're be not. preempting that pussy for your giant hell penis. Well, yeah. at this point, I'd say just bring on all the kitchen oils. Like this is oh, the my. one and only scenario. I'm tolerating it. Oh my God. It, well, it's not going in the end. So there's no damage to the rectal tissue. So Caleb is like, well, why fight the inevitable? Let's just engage in a heterosexual coitus. And the quote is, come out and play with me, my star. I know you're in there somewhere burning away where you think no one can see you. Imagine how brightly you'd shine if you embraced all that fire. At this stage, my star is a gorgeous nickname. It's cute. It's whimsical. It's fucking majestic. You know what isn't cute? Especially when you want to fuck someone. Little one. I would have been okay with my star, even though I really didn't like it either. I'm not going to lie to you. I didn't really like any of the nicknames in this book. I just wanted her to just be Esther or something yeah. like that. Esther, fuck it up. Even Ellen. Oh, I, can, I don't know if I could Ellen. do Ellen. Uh, it's just too <laughs> random for this book, I think. Ellen would really throw me off. So they finally kiss against a tree, but they have to then get to the village before nightfall. So she stops him and apologizes for stopping them from making out. And he says, I would wait an eternity for you. Little one, you never need to be Just sorry. Blank it out. We go from my star, which I could deal with, especially when you think of like fated lovers. Like maybe there was a star. He looked at like <clears throat> you know night court vibes, and you know that would give him <clears throat> hope. And mm, no, we'd go right back to little one because she's a child. Well, yeah, she is a comparison to him and his schlong. So they go to the village and get her some new boots and some cloaks. And we get a lot of dialogue about Estrella wearing pants for the first time, specifically leggings. But that's not important because they're caught. So they run. They're running and running and running. And then our girl falls and scrapes her face and hands and body. And Caleb is worried. He gives her a piggyback for the rest of the way and then tends to her wounds after they've lost all of the villagers. They have deserted the peasants. You eat those peasants. They have. You eat them. It is also at this minute that my brain goes, is this Luke Skywalker and Yoda? Where Yoda is on Luke Skywalker's <laughs> back and they're running through the marsh. <laughs> I hope it's not. Here is where the whole blood licking thing from Lord Fancy Hands, that comes back in from the beginning. It's relevant again because Kaylin literally licks the wounds from her hands. And the quote is, heat flowed through my veins burning me from the inside in a way that made me want all the things I shouldn't and reminding me of the way he'd rubbed his shaft against me when I pinned to the tree. And this scene immediately reminded me of Lord Fancy Hands. And, well, I'm not far off because this guy gives similar vibes, probably less manicured hands, but the, the whole, whole thing, I'm just not about. I'm not yeah. about keep your tongue away yeah. from me. Yeah, like, just, go that's just a good rule. checked, my dude. Anyway, Calum is basically like, my woman must protect. And our girl is like, no, surely not. He's not being this weird, but she is indeed wrong. The quote is, you don't just decide a woman was yours to protect after a few days spent together, right? Wrong. You are wrong. Very incorrect. Yeah. So they're still walking, and uh, I don't remember where the fuck we are, but we're walking nonetheless, and her injuries are healing super fast, and the tension is building. Anyway, she thinks that she could fall in love with this man, and I'm really not convinced, but nonetheless, she asks him to tell her a story, and then he tells her about fame mates. He tells her this really sad story about about a female that was cursed and his mate was hidden from him. 
And she lived many lives and died because, again, there's a whole reincarnation side plot in this book that we kind of skimmed over, but you're meant to have, like, 13 lives or some shit. So she's lived many lives and died, and he cried for her and tried to get to her, to bring her to Faya Soil so that they could complete the bond so that she could live forever and their lives could be tied together. But then the story was never finished. And we're we're like, oh, my God, wow, that's not any foreshadowing or any hints at all. And, like, the quote we get to justify it is, Caleb says, because life isn't always tidy, we don't always have the answers we want, and love isn't always pretty, he said. His gaze pointed as I swallowed audibly. It's messy and painful, but it is always worthwhile. It is always the answer, my star, not the problem. It was at this moment that we were like, it's you. Yep. Anyway, they're about to get hot and heavy, but her ankle is very, very much not okay. She's still quite injured, and he is like, literally for the first and only time in this book, no, let us wait. We have all the time in the world, and we are all shocked by this. Yeah. So they are then found by these people, and a brawl in shoes. Shoes? Shoes. Shoes, they're shoes. They start <laughs> by rolling. <laughs> There's a lot of footwear. <laughs> <laughs> our girl apparently can fight because remember she has had basic self-defense training from the slow loris that is enough for her to hold her own against the rebel forces that's right so yeah we, we meet the resistance it's very exciting apparently the fame are also marked when they are born and can use a glamour to cover their ears and they happen to have this guard that can just see past the glamour he can cannot. he though? Can he He's though? He's not very good at his job. You had one job, one. sir. Literally one. So then they go with the resistance, and this one guy is very handsy with our girl, and Caleb is not happy. The quote we get is, if you value that hand, you will remove it immediately, Caleb growled. Or what, pretty boy? Jensen asked, raising an eyebrow at Caleb in challenge. Or I will sever it from your wrist and give it to her as a token of my affection. It's like when a cat... Yeah. Brings you a dead bird. I was about to be on the train of like, yes, I will let her stab. And it's like, actually, no, it's a cat bringing you a dead mouse. (laughs) You can really picture him doing that, though. Yeah, like, being like, I have, look, why aren't you, why are you crying? I've just brought you a seven I've limb. I've just bought you it's exactly. a piece of fish. <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> well, they end up going to the safe haven for the rebel forces, which is warded by a witchy poo to keep the marked from being hunted. Calum is an alpha male asshole and is like, we must share a bed and stay together. At all times, instead of going into their gender specified quarters. And it's like, give me a break. Again, you've known each other less than 24 hours at this point, Uh maybe longer, but I think we've had a few nights together now. But it's like, just let her go in the room by herself for for a moment, sir. So they agree to stay together at night after she gives him somewhat of a verbal lashing for trying to put her on a leash. And they also do a Reese and Feyre and decide when the time comes, they will die together. Look, Reese and Feyre had three books of trauma before they made that stupid bond. We have had, you know what, I'm going to say it, 22 hours. That's it. He fed you fish and refers to you like a child. Why are we suddenly ready to die with this Mm. man? No. We're not. He smells like fish fingers. (laughs) Run. It's like fish fingers. So the next morning they go down to eat some breakfast and the rest of the (laughs) game And they meet up with a witch who is not just a girl with some rose quartz at Coachella. No, she is a real witch. She's got like the glowing eyes and the glowing fingertips. And she smiles at them, which is like code language for, yeah, they're not hiding as Faye. And so now people decide to actually start talking to them. And then we meet Amelie, who introduces herself to our main couple. And is she of any relevance to this story? None whatsoever no none then the witch comes up and does a caleb and sniffs our girl <laughs> just a big old big just inhale caleb is obviously like um excuse me that is my hair to sniff we are monogamous hair mm. sniffers and she tells our girl that death is calling to her at this stage not a single one of us is surprised the hints are just dropping in fast it's just mm-hmm. a lot we then meet sky who almost flirts with Caleb, but then he says, no, I'm in a monogamous heterosexual relationship with this woman right here that I met 24 hours this ago. Woman. And we are 
proud. But again, white man doing yep. the bare minimum. They eat soup and bread, and he again feeds her because she's a she's child. A baby. It's apparently a very sexy scene or whatever the fuck, but no, what the fuck? No, it just really gave me Travis vibes. Like oh. Woody and Travis just all up in each other's business, playing tonsil hockey in front of like Chris Jenner. So they stare into each other's eyes while they feed each other. And was, I'm just glad he's not feeding her like a bird oh, at this what point. The fuck. At this point, was he the bird? Was he not the bird? I wouldn't put it past him. He could. He could have options to be able to do that. Oh, God. He's a pecker. Mm -hmm. So then they get shown the bathing rooms, and it's just like one giant orgy again, but there's no dead Billy this time. So they then talk about jobs and work and the like. Jensen tells, he essentially says to her, look, you're in a commune. The majority of us have dicks. You've got a vagina. Put it to use. And she's like, that sounds really unappealing and I do not feel comfortable with Literally that Literally like, all. let us use you as a walking fleshlight. So he tries to pressure her into doing it. And even though she has the utmost respect for women who have the confidence and ability to do so, she feels like her and Caleb are in a monogamous hair sniffing relationship of 24 hours. And she will not be entertaining any more men because one giant penis is more than enough. We get this quote. One of these days, I will enjoy watching him bleed to death. Same. That's what Caitlin Same. said. About the okay, creepy guy. Clear. Yeah. It, it tracks. Anyway, she feels intimate with Caitlin, but she then feels like a nagging at the back of your head. Her brother's judgmental stare. And I'm like, who? Oh, right. The brother so, that tried to fucking kill you. The brother that is as bland as fucking Sultana Bland cereal. <laughs> oh, right. God. Okay. Oh, yeah, it makes complete sense. Cool. Caleb decides to tell her another story about the sealy and unsealy courts of the Fae. Will this become relevant? We are unsure. They then talk about how Fae's can't have offspring unless it's with their mate and they can only have two. But humans, marked or not, can reproduce like rabbits if they want. It is at this stage that I begin to get stressed about a breeding mm. kink. That will come back as well. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. So they end up falling asleep and then she wakes up in the middle of the night. It's your time to shine, Georgia. <laughs> in the middle of the night. <laughs> Weird. The big delay. Just <laughs> solid. So she wakes up in the middle of the night. He's not there. He's having a secret meeting with the witch. And apparently it's about the wards, but... You know, our girl Estrella, she's not that silly. He's manipulating the entire situation and completely gaslighting her into being jealous. Ew. And I fucking can't stand it. Nope. We get this quote. I would burn the world to the ground and lay it at your feet if you so much as asked it of me. And yet you give me nothing. You've never once told me that you feel the same way I do. Well, no shit. Sherlock, I fucking don't feel the same way. I'm not willing to burn a blade of grass down for you. I literally just met you. However, I am perfectly able to express my feelings of jealousy when you make demands about me and then go off gallivanting in the night with witchy friends. Big ick. Men. Big ick. So she admits that she wants him and a make out shesh begins. She's like, you're going to break me because his pin eye is so very large. But she actually <laughs> doesn't mean it like that, but that's how we're taking it. He says, yep. no, little one, I'm going to love you. He said, touching his forehead to mine, his dark eyes glimmered, tiny specks of light shining in the obsidian like stars that had become my namesake. I would like it noted, dark eyes. You remember how we were at blue eyes? Now we're yeah. at dark eyes. Anyways. Until you forget what it is to hurt and then long after that, until the scars you wear like armor have faded from memory and only we remain so whatever they wake up and everything is so happy and it's way too happy for me i'm not vibing it so basically everyone is like to our girl like you just need to like chill out like, he's really possessive of you babe you just need some space because it's just going to end in heartbreak you know you're both say marked you, you've got a faded mate out there when they come that's it. And I'm like, that's fine, but can we just have the built-up sex scene yet? I really want to see this man literally pulverize this woman's insides. <laughs> Look, I, I want that to happen, but I want her to be happy about it. Oh, yeah. And it's just still unconvinced. At this stage, she's also still trying to figure out what she's going to do for work because she doesn't want to be a lady of the night. She doesn't want to fuck everyone. But turns out she can read and she's one of the only people that can. So she ends up basically becoming a historian. She oh. finds a book on the old gods and the god of the dead and goes, wait a minute, that dead man 
and I have the same mark. Caleb has the same mark as well. What a kawinky dink. So, and- Caleb arrives and he's like, enough study, more finger dinger doodling. <laughs> He says, I assure you, I do not give the first fuck what is normal when it comes to you. If you want to watch the world burn, I'll set it on fire for you. If you want to slaughter every woman who has ever taken what is yours, then I will gladly sit back and watch you play, he said. A twisted smile toying about his lips as he dropped his mouth to my lips and sank his teeth into the plump flesh. Now fucking come for me, Estrella. Just that last, now fucking come for me, Estrella. That Look, is we're, the best one. It is. There's no little one. There's no weird, mm-hmm. weird context. It's just use me for your pleasure, which is one of my favorite things. From here. Anyway, the whole dropped his mouth to my lips and sank his teeth into the plump flesh. Yeah, he just biting off on now. He's just literally yeah. like, give me that lip. Nom, 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 nom. A juicy plum. Juicy plum. Oh, God. So from this stage, Estrella is like, I cannot just read books all day. I must physically exercise. And again, I cannot mm-hmm. relate. But she decides to train with Caelan, but he's holding back on her. So Melon, a.k.a. resistance leader lady, who we kind of skimmed past, decides that she's going to train with her because she won't hold back. Yes, and her name is Melon, cool. a.k.a. Honeydew Melon, the most boring of the melons. Yeah, no. not according to Castile. Is it just a bad joke that's gone on mm. too long? And now he can't mm-hmm. turn back? Is it like every birthday now she brings him out a plate of honeydew and he's like, fuck, I should have picked something yeah. better? We learn that the old gods look just like humans, just more. And I'm unsure what that is, but I get the vibe that it kind of sounds like I love interest. Mm. Is not interesting? They go out afterwards for a bath and she's like a child. It's annoying. But we get another hint at how big this guy must be because... He gets to his knees in front of her and he's still at her boobs. Like he's kneeling down, motivating her, essentially. Which that is literally the ice planet of the barbarians type shit. That is huge motherfucker. Oh, God. Sorry, I just read the book. I just read the book. It's in my head. Yeah. Look, they get into the pool and he is washing her hair and her boobies and her hoo ha. And the quote is, I had my fingers inside you only yesterday, my star. Do you think I would hesitate to wash your cunt before I bury my tongue inside it? This is my time to give you a PSA announcement. Normally it's Ellie telling you not to put oil in your anus. This time it is me telling you not to put soap in your coochie. That shit regulates. It cleans itself. Stop putting soap or scented things up there. You will fuck with your pH and you will then get an autoimmune condition or thrush. It's not fun. Just leave it be. Just let that poor nanny be. So Estrella goes, well, you have washed my coochie. I will now wash you. And he decides, well, I have a cleanliness kink. And I'm hungry. Lay back, my dear, so I may feast on that pussy. He does, in fact, feast on the punani. She comes and then they fuck. And it's slow and it's kind for the first time of fucking. And he loves to, like, chit-chat while he's, like, balls deep in, which is awesome. We love some dirty talk. But I was expecting, like, some, like, wall-shaking, mountain-quaking, like, hold-the-headboard type shit. You know, she's not a virgin. She can take it. But then also I guess his cock is, like, three times the size of, like, a normal peni, so. And the only other sexual penetration she's had was from (laughs) so Lawrence. must have been very slow (laughs) yes so she believes that when they both come that she will never be the same again and it's just like another foreshadowing moment because like wasn't it like when they fuck like something happens or like Mm -hmm. yeah the whole accepting the mating bond thing was meant to be done on face soil but it's just giant orgy coitus so is it just that They've basically done everything except for the fact of where mm. they've fucked and they made it. So mm. I don't know. Um, but essentially, know. they've accepted the bond now, so Eat that's it. fine. Eat it. Have. So we're back in the library now after the tongue punching of the pussy. And this motherfucker, Jensen, shows up and tries to get it on with Esty. Not Esty. Esty. D. Caleb obviously shows up and is like, touch her and you will die. A brawl again ensues. She is like, stop it because I'm a strong woman, even though that guy 100% would have tried to rape me and it could have ended terribly. And it's just, 
It's just weird. Weird vibes all around. She's very much trying to assert her independence and I feel as though this may not have been the right scenario. Maybe when he was having like eye sex with her over the soup or demanding to share a bed with her. Mm. Maybe not quite when he's trying to prevent her from being sexually assaulted. But yeah, yeah. look fair. From here, Kalen takes her to the beach because, yes, we forgot about Sultana Brand, but mm-hmm. there he is. And she says that she misses her family. And again, we're like, okay, he's dead. We get it. Oh, shit. Yeah, she does have a mum still. Yeah. Cool. Yep, that makes sense. Yeah, oh, yeah. Whoops. We forgot about it. She's just still sitting there in the wheelchair being like, run. <laughs> They're like, it's been I'm 24 still- hours. The Kalen comes out with the, I'm your family now. Like he's the captain mm. in that Tom Hanks movie. Like, I, <laughs> I'm your family now. And then he takes this moment to say that he loves her. And the quote is, but I promise you, my heart beats for you. It's been 38 hours. Fucking hell. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so they're going back to the safety of the wards and a cave beast appears. It's terrifying and <gasps> it's ugly and we hate it, but it must be done because trauma and plot. Anyway. Caelan, mm-hmm. because he is the big, muscly, macho man, must fight the beast. And, of course, we think that he's dead, but, of course, he is not dead. Surprise. But he is very injured, and they must face their next battle from this point, which is Estrella's jealousy over him having to bathe in front of other women to clean the wound. Again, for more plot. So at this stage, they get him to the hot springs and he's injured after fighting the cave beast, but he's survived, which he shouldn't have been able to do. But anyways, so he gets in the water with his ginormous schlong and the bath is full of people because, again, Mm. orgy bath. And they're all like, oh, gosh, an injury, but also giant schlong. And at this stage, (laughs) she must also (laughs) enter the hot springs. I'm so sorry. I'm just (laughs) picturing, like, the three of us in there just doing, like, our weekly bath. And then we're like... Oh, fuck, he's bleeding. Oh, what the (laughs) fuck is that? So she must also enter the hot springs to wash his wounds. And he says, no, you must not because I will fuck you if you touch me because this makes sense. And she's like, well, you are injured and I was scared for your life, but I guess we could make time. Fuck me. And look, (laughs) there was a big reaction. He is like, even though I am unfortunately injured, my raging hormones must go caveman and I need to dominate that pussy in front of every witness here. He does not fuck her initially. Like, she's got to clean his wounds. And again, he just watches her not flinching while she soaps his wounds. That's fucked up. Like, that is fucked up. It's a lot. And there's all these mentions of how she should be afraid of him. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, we already know who he is. But um, next minute, the fucking ensues. So he took the answer I hadn't been ready to voice. The distinct slickness of me coaching his fingers as he shoved them inside me and worked my pussy open for the cock that would tear me in two, which sounds absolutely delightful. Being torn in two. There's also a lot of words, brutality, battering impaled, slapping. But they're just interesting words to use when describing a sex thing. But He took the answer I hadn't been ready to voice. So she didn't didn't verbally, enthusiastically consent. Mm -hmm. And then shoved his fingers in and worked my pussy open (laughs) for the cock. Just get a winch and just... (laughs) So in this scene, Caleb is just fucking literally... Insane. I've taken multiple quotes. Which, FYI, at this stage, everyone in the orgy bath is watching this They are happen. literally, because as me, Bryony, and Ellie are sitting in one of these baths, like, is this actually going to happen right here? Oh, my God, it is. Oh. Where did he get that winch from? <laughs> <laughs> Where did that car jack come from? What the fuck? So, quote number one, show me my fucking cunt, he ordered, slapping his free hand down on the outside of my thigh, when I didn't immediately relent, show them what they will never have. And at least he didn't slap the pussy. Yeah. Yeah. Just- no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, point number two. Tonight when we're in bed and I've got my cock between your legs again, they'll be lying in their bed jerking their cocks to the memory of me fucking you. They'll be wishing they were able to make you scream the way I do. And do you know what I'll do? I'll fill you with so much of my cum that they can smell it on you tomorrow and remember exactly who you belong to. Because <laughs> she's property. Oh, just the thought of smelling like cum. Like, 
And it no, dripping. That's not what you Ew. want. It must, must drip like you're a melting <laughs> candle. <laughs> So point number three, the final one. I want you to come. I want you to clench that tight little pussy around my cock and milk the cum from my balls until it's dripping down your thighs. That's the only gift I want. He wants to be milked like a cow. Okay. Mm. Each to their own. So she does just that. She (laughs) squeezes those udders and produces the (laughs) chocolate. Then... They exit the bath and there's a lady who's just standing there. It's Georgia handing them towels. She's like, off you go, you scallywags. Get going, you scallywags. Now look at all the mess we've got. You got an ejaculate (laughs) all over the orgy pool. It's just floating on top. (laughs) Estrella then goes back to work in the library and we learn that a line of witches basically sacrifice themselves to create the veil because they stole something. From the court of shadows and had to hide it. I bet it's her. Interesting. Doctor. As soon as she starts trying to figure shit out, Caleb interrupts. And then Melon interrupts because all of the interrupting. And Melon is like, yo, tough boy, we need to go on a skedaddle of an- adventure and like save some peasants. <laughs> skedaddle of woo. <laughs> skedaddle of <woo> adventure. <laughs> <laughs> Estrella is like, I cannot leave this man. I must go with him because if one dies, we both die. So now we're both going on a skedaddle woo adventure. <laughs> she gets some pants because weather appropriate clothing. And while she's changing, Melon sees her scars and is like, oh my God, you have trauma. Melon then gives Estrella a purple drink, some Rabina, but it's actually poison in case she gets captured. <laughs> This issue is not revisited in this book, so FYI. While they're going on their little skedaddle woo adventure, Melon decides to set be like, hey, FYI, I don't trust the guy you're fucking, not one bit. And Estrella doesn't know enough about him, actually, to even be able to salvage Melon's trust mm. in him. We realise she doesn't know where he's from, doesn't know his family name. He's given her vague information. And even though Caleb isn't close enough to be able to hear their conversation, he turns around and has a weird look on his face. What a coincidence. Mm. Caleb is not happy about having to go through a city on this rescue mission because she's in danger if she's there. He's like, nah, fuck him. But she's like, no, I am pro-life and I don't want them to die. So they go on their journey, but then next minute, a fae is there, just a random, isolated mm-hmm. fae. And the fae is like, oh, my God, he does have a human mate. Again, Estrella does not pick up the hint. A fight ensues and they're surrounded by fae. There is no longer an isolated fae. There are multiple fae. They're popping up like a <laughs> whack-a-mole in a very murderous arcade. They run and Caleb and Jensen end up closing the gate so that they're safe. And Estrella is, like, banging on the door like, no, Caleb and your monster dick, come back. <laughs> she hears someone say her name and she's like, Jensen, is that you? Caleb? And, of course, it's Caleb because Jensen's dead. Apparently, Caleb didn't kill him, but he didn't save him either. And remember we had that quote about watching him bleed? Mm. Mm. Interesting. Anyway, a girl is very sleepy. She's a very, very sleepy girl. And Caleb is rocking her to sleep, but not before we get this quote. If you keep searching for answers, my star... It's likely you'll find them. And it's like, indeed, that is the point of a question, my friend. That is <laughs> the point in a question is to get an answer. Arguably, that's the point of a book is that you ask questions to get yeah, an answer. Yeah. So Estrella wakes up and Caleb is, of course, gone. He's a wandering mm. man. So she finds him, and but she can sense that this man is the man she fell in love with. He's got, like, some monster energy going about him. But that doesn't stop her from fucking him. Classic stitch up. They end up fucking in the snow, and he asks her if she loves him. She finally gives in and says it back. And then when they finish fucking, he looks at his cum dripping out of her and is like, yes, this is wonderful. And then he drags his fingers through it and shoves it <laughs> back up inside her. Ew. He's like, I need those ducks clogged. <laughs> no, you don't. Let me no, clog those and ducks. This has literally made my and my first shrivel up and fucking die. And, like, yeah. literally my fear of the breeding kink has returned in full yeah. force. He essentially forces her 
to tell him that she loves him during sex. He says to her, if I'm a god, then you have to give me a gift. Those are the rules. This is like mid-sex. Fuck off. Your giant fucking pain is impaling my bodily organs as we speak. I'm not giving you a gift. Just shut the fuck up, you big dweeb. Anyway, so we see this city that they've been travelling to. I don't know at this point what the fuck it's called. And honestly, I don't really give a flying fuck. But anyway, it's a city that's been destroyed, and apparently it's been destroyed by the god of death. Anyway, he lived there with some people who worshipped him. They turned on him. And we get this quote, They pulled his legs from his body and sawed through the cock he loved so much and fed it to the pigs they disemboweled him letting his guts hang down to the ground from where he hung and tore his piercing blue eyes from his skull before they let the birds peck at his eye sockets yikes (laughs) and blue eyes again though so maybe his fae form has blue eyes so when he's in disguise, he doesn't. Yeah. I wonder if he got to pick how big his penis was when he grew it back. He went to a Bigger. cosmetic surgeon and was like, I have some trauma. Can I have a ginormous yeah, schlong have- that can be used <laughs> as a weapon? Yeah, I need it to be able to cut grass. <laughs> and also to cut grass. <laughs> he is the police in the city. <laughs> Arriving on the scene, he's no. on a bike, <laughs> it's just his and just it is propelling him forward. <laughs> oh like my Mary god! Poppins, but with a penis. <laughs> oh, okay, Estrella doesn't agree that this was the way the gods deserve to be treated. But she likes them to have their penises intact. In fact, the others don't agree with her, except for Caelan, which is surprising. He's being very ominous again, saying things like, "You should be afraid of me, and don't look for answers." You aren't ready for and all of this weird shit. I'm getting the ick. Uh, it's it's the ick has been it's arrived, it's set it in, it's pitched it's literally it's stay in the night. This book is what lies beyond the ick. <gasps> Nothing. We don't know. Hopefully we'll find out Nothing. in book two. <laughs> Next minute. Beck is missing. One of the, the, the men that Melon's fucking Caleb stops Estrella and then Melon is skewered like a kebab on a sword. Gosh. It's all very dramatic. It all happens very quickly. Our girl then gets captured and is about to die when Caelan goes, Grandmommy, it's me, Anastasia. No. no. For sake, Bryony. He does not. He does not say that. He just Bryony. <laughs> magic. He's like there and he drops his like human magic and becomes his full form and it's like, Grandmommy. But the cock, the and then cock you're like, no. actually has a mouth. <laughs> Grandmummy, it's me, Anastasia, and it's got the blue eyes. And in reality, the Fae form is just a giant penis. It's quite pretty. That's it. Oh, my God. So he drops the bombshell that everyone saw coming and releases the glamour he had on himself all along. He is really Willy Wonka. (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. He's a god of death. (laughs) The quote we get is, The man I'd fallen in love with had never really existed. Caleb wasn't real, nothing but a deception. I'd seen the likeness of his true form before, seen drawings and statues of that beautiful, terrifying face and the horror of his power over the dead. Coldress. A.K.A. She's like, she's like, let the other fame art go and I'll go with you. And Caleb is like, lol, babes, you're coming anyway. We're going to skedaddle a on an adventure. We learn that, of course, apparently the humans lied, the books lied, and that the fae ended the war. One fae had to sacrifice his life to make the veil. I don't know. Look, honestly, this page, book with, I don't even I know. I don't even think George was alive for this part of the book. So I don't even know who wrote these notes. <laughs> no, was it George? I can't even remember this happening. <laughs> Caleb says that he broke the veil to get to her. I have felt you live and die for countless lives, felt every one of your life cycles end and grieved the woman I never got to meet. I know you because you are the other half of me. Those foreign blue eyes bled to black as he stared at me and his magic comes between us. You are my mate, Estrella. Nothing will ever come between us now that I have you at my side. Famous last words. I just picture a giant worm staring at her, but it's just a penis. (laughs) He's like, why don't you love me? (laughs) He's got no arms. He's just like swiveling with his balls on the ground. (laughs) Look. Final notes. I love a fated mate storyline. I love the idea of like this tragic romance where he's been separated from her and has felt her die numerous times. I love that idea, but it's so forced. Yeah. The only potential redeemable quality for future books is if Caleb 
is Tamlified and we get a new love interest. Yeah, this book Did just needs Kaylin, to Kaylin. yeet. Fuck it out of my face. Mm-hmm. It's cursed and this episode has been cursed. Ellie, do you have a music reference? Why, yes, I do. It is. Nearly Furtado, I'm like a bird. <sighs> that's it. That's all I've got for you because I'm not I'm not going that deep with this fucking book. Sorry. Yeah. I did my I did my due diligence. I tried to find fan art and I could only find one and it was so not good that I don't want to speak about it. <laughs> yep. There's none. There's none. So next episode, we are covering Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller. It's good. It's beautiful even. And then we're going to have a little bit of a break, but we're going to tell you what we'll be reading after that anyways. Okay. Okay, here we go. Listener recommendation, The Hating Game. Oh, my gosh. Oh, nice. I recently watched the movie of that, so I'm very excited because I also have read the book. That's exciting. That's a nice little yeah. break from fantasy yeah. smut land. Yeah, awesome. Nice little rom-com. All right. I love that. And you can also watch the movie as well, and we can do like a little comparison if you guys have time. Ooh, oh, we can. Thank you for uh, tuning in on this one. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Cursed episode. It literally was a fucked episode. I wish you guys knew all the stress that we have all gone through for this. It's literally cursed us all. So just so you're all aware. I am almost at 10K, so the giveaway is motherfucking coming. It might actually happen on the two week break. Anyways, Get um, yeah. Don't forget to like, follow, subscribe, all those things. Rate us. Um, check us out on TikTok, the social medias. This, this, this. You know what to do. You know, we say this bill every week, but we just like to inform you again because if you're new here, I'm sorry that this was the first episode that you've watched and listened to. <laughs> I'm so yeah. sorry. Please go listen to another one. I swear they're, no, no, they're all this chaotic. Anyway, we'll see you guys next week. Bye.